When you think of a classic tale, Peter Pan is certainly one which comes to mind. With it having a significant number of adaptations throughout the years, everyone will have their favourite version, whether that be a pantomime or one of the many films like 1991's Hook, 2003's Peter Pan, or even maybe 2015's Pan. <laughs> Are you serious? In 2023, we have the upcoming Peter Pan and Wendy film, but before we get to that, let's look at what is, for the majority of people, their favourite version of the story, and that is the Disney animated classic from 1953, 70 years ago. The film begins with an opening credits, which at the time was the norm for Disney animated films, where you'd get some of the standout music play in the background, and it would really tuck you in for the adventure you're about to experience. During this, they make it clear that the film was based on the 1904 play by Sir James Matthew Barry. Now, Barry did die 16 years prior to the film's release, but he did leave the copyright ownership with the Great Ormond Street Hospital, and so they got into an agreement with Disney for them to acquire the rights. This was all agreed in the late 30s, but the Second World War did provide quite a hefty delay to proceedings, and so the film didn't get released until 1953, following Alice in Wonderland and before Lady and the Tramp. Once the opening credits have concluded, we get right into the film, and appropriately, the first shot is of the second star to the right. The initial voice we hear is from a narrator, and the first couple of lines he says are actually quite important, them being, all of this has happened before, and it will all happen again. He continues by saying this time it happened in London, and in particular on a street in Bloomsbury with the Darling family. The narrator goes on to explain that this house was chosen by Peter Pan because those within it believe in him, uh, although he does mention that George Darling, the father, is more of a practical man. The voice actor behind Mr. Darling was Hans Conroyd, and funny enough, he also voiced Captain Hook as well, because in that original play, those two roles would be played by the same actor. And also in the play, the dog and the crocodile would have dual roles, so that's why later in the film we see TikTok show dog-like expressions. Now, keeping with the dog Nana, we see her early on in the film pouring out medicine for the Darling children. Um, that medicine, however, is potentially morphine and alcohol, as that was a very common thing during that era. And so, yeah, the dog is basically drugging the kids. That is not appropriate behavior, okay? Keeping things wholesome, though, Nana is a beloved character of this film, and also within the film, too. Following an outburst from Mr. Darling where he's upset about the kids drawing a treasure map on his shirt front, he demands that this be Wendy's last night in the nursery. Um, and while that's all going on, he gets into a bit of a tangle with Nana and they both end up on the floor, but the family rush over to Nana instead of him. Nana gets banished outside and even then still helps Mr. Darling by finding the rope. Poor Nana. Poor Nana. The three kids, Wendy, John and Michael, get put to bed by Mrs. Darling. Uh, John can't believe the absolute poppycock which came out of his dad's mouth about Peter Pan not being real. And Wendy wants the window left open because she thinks that Peter Pan might come back to get his shadow. As Mr. and Mrs. Darling leave the house to go out for the night, we are then introduced to Peter Pan and Tinkerbell. Peter Pan's look was based on his voice actor, Bobby Driscoll, and Bobby Driscoll has been in the news very recently due to the Chip and Dale film, and that's because that put his situation into the forefront. And his situation was a very tragic one because once his film's ad campaign was complete, his seven-year contract was ripped up by Disney due to him having severe acne, so he was literally growing up. And then he eventually got no more roles and went down a path of drugs and died by a heart failure and his body was found uh, by two kids in an abandoned building so it really was a sad story with him and it's a story which still gets brought up today about how he was handled by disney walt disney himself didn't think peter pan was very likable but his portrayal in this film is faithful to barry's work and he has influenced as well other creators like tolkien for example with pan and the elves you can see the correlation there Back to the film now, Peter Pan and Tinkerbell are looking around the bedroom for his shadow. They do find it in one of the drawers, but while he's trying to retrieve the shadow, he accidentally locks Tinkerbell in the drawer. Peter chases and scraps with his shadow, and that wakes up Wendy, and she helps him reattach it. And we learn in this scene that Peter comes to the Darling House because he wants to listen to Wendy's stories, because for the most part, they're about him. Peter and Wendy talk, and you can see the admiration she has for Peter, and she wants to give him a kiss, but she is stopped in her tracks by Tinkerbell, who escapes the draw just in time. 
All of this commotion wakes up the boys and Tinkerbell gets across that she thinks Wendy is a big ugly girl. And if you haven't seen this film in a while, you might have forgot how jealous of a character Tinkerbell is because she is quite the nasty fairy slash pixie. But even still, she is a popular character amongst many people and I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that she's not perfect. She does progress throughout the film and we do get to see her true nature. And of course, she has that universal appeal because she's an inaudible character, so there is no language barrier there. Peter wants to take Wendy to Neverland, but she says that if she's going, the boys have to go as well. But they do have a big hurdle in place, and that is they can't fly. So Peter helps them learn how to fly via thinking of a wonderful thought. They rhyme like there's no tomorrow as they're about to get on their way. And here might be worth noting the things they say. One important thing they'll need though to fly is pixie dust. So Pan picks up Tinkerbell and pats her like a salt dispenser. The dust goes everywhere and they fly out the window. Now the dust wasn't originally in the story for them to fly, but Jay and Barry added fairy dust as a requirement to fly after injuries to kids in real life trying to fly themselves. What's this caper, love? We're flying! Obviously. This scene of them flying around London is probably the most iconic one from the film, especially when we see them land on Big Ben. Just before that though, Michael shakes some pixie dust out of Tinkerbell onto Nana, and she flies up while being attached to the rope and waves goodbye to them. And I always thought at this moment, like, poor Nana, she's just sort of floating there now, I guess, for however long. Hello, Mrs. Pummelhorst. I'd like to get down now. As we zoom into the second star to the right, it does kind of feel like a play, actually, because it is the end of the first act. And so now entering Neverland, we get introduced to the pirates. Before we meet Captain Hook, we see his second in command, Mr. Smee, and he's voiced by Bill Thompson, who voice the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland and he's not the only actor to come over from that film because Catherine Beaumont who voiced Alice voices Wendy. When we get to Captain Hook he's looking at a map trying to find Peter Pan's hideout and the locations on the map are those which were hinted at by the kids earlier. In this scene Hook uses the word redskins when describing the Native American Indians and because of that Disney Plus has a warning message on before you watch the film just to make people aware that there are outdated terms in this film. Back to Captain Hook now and he makes a pretty strong first impression about whose boss as this according playing pirate starts singing a bit too much to his distaste and so he shoots him. Following this we have a conversation between Smee and Captain Hook where we learn that Pan chopped off Hook's hand and fed it to a crocodile and now that crocodile is hungry for more. But fortunately for Captain Hook the crocodile did also swallow an alarm clock and so that does warn them of his arrival. To lighten the mood we next have a comedy moment where Smee starts to shave Captain Hook a seagull lands on Hook's towel and Smee accidentally starts to shave a seagull's backside. The pirates on the ship spot Peter Pan and Co in the sky and so Hook orders them to fire cannonballs at them and while Pan's dodging all the balls uh, he orders Tinkerbell to escort the kids down to land. Tinkerbell flies way ahead of the kids to get to the Lost Boys so she can encourage them to shoot down Wendy and this is the most evil we see Tinkerbell as she will happily see Wendy fall to her death. The boys tell Peter that Tinkerbell said it was a Wendy bird and so Peter has a stern talk with her where he eventually banishes her forever. Here in the story the kids split up as Wendy goes with Peter to see the mermaid and Michael and John go with the boys to try and capture some Indians. What comes next is one of the most famous songs from the film following the leader and it's quite an easy song to sing because a lot of the lyrics do consist of gobbledygook. Now in the play the lost boys were infants who fell out of their prams when the nurses weren't looking and so when compared to Peter Pan who's a permanent resident of Neverland, the Lost Boys were only temporary lodgers. And it does get quite dark because if they do seem to grow up, Peter Pan would kill them to avoid overpopulation and a potential challenger to his rule. Luckily, none of that is in the film, but with Peter Pan in the public domain, I'd not be surprised to see something quite dark like that happen because we've already seen it with other stories. Back to the film, and as the boys are trying to strategize how to capture the Indians, instead they get ambushed themselves. With the boys and the teddy bear captured, the chief reveals that the hunting of one another is a game they play. But this time it is no game as Princess Tiger Lily is missing and the chief wants to know where she is. Hopping over to Peter and Wendy, as they meet the mermaids we see that like Tinkerbell, they are a jealous bunch and they try and drag Wendy into the water. But as the light goes dim, Peter Pan spots Hook and Smee with a captured tiger lily. TikTok the crocodile follows closely behind Hook and, you know, fortunately for Hook he's not living in today's world, otherwise TikTok would be in every direction. I have a Roblox date tonight. Do I play Roblox? No. 
Hook and Smee take Tiger Lily into a cave and he tells Tiger Lily that if she gives up Peter Pan's hideout location, then he will set her free. Hook displays his short fuse once again as he gets red in the face and then Pan decides to toy with both him and Smee by pretending to be an evil spirit. Spirit of the great sea water, is it? Peter Pan imitates Captain Hook's voice and tells Smee to return Tiger Lily and then when they run into Captain Hook it is a bit like Basil Fawlty and Manuel as he tells Smee to put her back. I take it, I take it. Come here. Hey. You're a waste of space. Oh! <laughs> Hook finds Peter and then we have our first fight between the two of them which results in Captain Hook swimming rapidly away from TikTok. Peter returns just in time to save a drowning Tiger Lily and at this moment this is actually the only time which we nearly hear Tiger Lily speak because she didn't say a word throughout the whole film but we nearly do hear her say help. Peter flies away with Tiger Lily and Wendy and that draws a close to Act 2. As we move into the final act, the animation is worth a mention because like for example on screen you can see the reflection on the sea, it still looks so good after all these years. Next up we see Captain Hook recovering from his TikTok chase and we also get another ounce of comedy from Smee. The poor captain has a splitting headache. We mustn't annoy him. Smee provides intel to Captain Hook about Peter Pan banishing Tinkerbell and that triggers an idea in Hook's head to go and capture the fairy and in this scene we also get to see his Sunday set of Hooks. As a thank you for rescuing Tiger Lily, the Chief rewards Pan with the title of Little Flying Eagle. The Chief wants to teach him about the Red Man and then we get the song What Made the Red Man Red and this song of course does include very uh, exaggerated stereotypes. Wendy gets told a couple of times she's not supposed to dance all while seeing Tiger Lily and Peter dance themselves so she says enough's enough and leaves. As we pan out from the camp we see Smee capture Tinkerbell. While Smee gets more and more drunk Captain Hook uses Tinkerbell's jealousy of Wendy to his advantage as he says they're going to go and Shanghai Wendy and so Tink reveals Hangman's tree as Pan's location. Hook decides to keep Tinkerbell captured and then we cross over to Hangman's tree where Wendy's telling the boys what her mother is and sings the song Your Mother and Mine. Outside we see the pirates approach and listen in to the song and uh, Michael and John want to return back to the mother and the lost boys want to join them but Peter Pan wants to stay in Neverland. As they leave the tree they all get captured by the pirates and Hook leaves a surprise gift for Pan. Now this gift turns out to be a bomb but in the play Hook spikes Pan's drink with poison but perhaps Disney thought they've already gone down that route once before so let's go with something different like a bomb. On the pirate ship the pirates sing a song to help convince the kids to join Captain Hook. Wendy says there's no need as Peter Pan will come and save them and at this point Smee and Hook crack up with laughter as they reveal that the bomb's going to go off at 6pm which is fast approaching. Think about escapes and saves Pan just in time so the explosion is not fatal and then we get back to Hook where he gives Wendy one last chance but she decides to walk the plank and as she falls there is no splash. You want a splash Mr. Starkey. I'll give you a splash. With Wendy saved by Peter we get our final battle of the film. Confident in victory Peter says he'll fight Hook with one hand behind his back and won't fly. Peter still gets the better of Hook and gets him to say that he's a codfish. Hook attempts one more swipe at Peter but falls off into TikTok's mouth and he is last seen swimming from TikTok yelling for Smee. It was at one point going to be a much darker ending with Captain Hook being killed and also a scene of the Darling family mourning the loss of their children. But that was not the case and we see Peter captain his ship and Tinkerbell makes it all gold as they return to London. 11pm strikes and Wendy wakes up near the open window and she recalls everything which happened to her parents and you think to yourself was it all just a dream then? Mr and Mrs Darling see the ship flying from the moon and George says that he thinks he's seen that ship before and that all harkens back to the opening line of the movie where uh, the narrator says all of this has happened before and all of this will happen again. And with this ending there's nothing 100% confirmed so it is an open one where you can still believe that it's a dream or you can believe that it all really happened. Overall Peter Pan is not one of my favourite Disney films far from it but you know away from the controversy it still does deliver a well told story. The songs in the film work well for the film but I wouldn't say a lot of them are ones you'll listen to afterwards like we've seen with some of the recent Disney films. The cold never bothered me anyway. Captain Hook is a really enjoyable villain and I think alongside a character like Smee they just bounce off each other so well. 
Peter Pan is a character who's very full of himself, but he just worked well as a main character. And alongside Tinkerbell, you know, they're both flawed characters, but by the end of the film, they do come good. Like we see Tinkerbell at one point want to see Wendy fall to her death, but by the end of the film, she helps Peter save Wendy from uh, her walking the plank. When watching this as a kid, did I enjoy the adventure? Yes. Would I have gone to Neverland? Absolutely. And this story has a good moral. You know, growing up is a necessary part of life rather than something that should be avoided. And the Peter Pan story is one which has inspired many storytellers you know, throughout the years and will do so forevermore. We'll have to see how the 2023 Peter Pan and Wendy compares to this one. Uh, but before that, let me know your thoughts on this film and what your general thoughts are on Peter Pan as a story overall. And if you wish to watch another video on screen right now, is a video which YouTube are recommending for you.